Ever since Skyrim came out in 2011, we have seen modifications renew the game's capabilities time and time again, and as the years have gone by, these mods have only been getting better. So much so, that the start of this year, over 9 years after the game's initial release, might just be one of the greatest starts to a year of Skyrim modding. Today I'll try to do my best to give you the very best overview of what's been going on on the Nexus these first months of our new year, cause there have indeed been a lot of goodies. So from one Skyrim mods connoisseur to another, allow me to say, welcome welcome ladies and gentlemen of the internet to another video in our somewhat weekly... Somewhat weekly? You sure you don't mean monthly, you stupid milk drinker? <laughs> oh, okay, really Frognar? Was that necessary? Come on guys, really? I, you know making these takes a lot of time, right? Well, anyways, as I was saying, welcome to the somewhat weekly Skyrim mod series, a series where we take a real good look at the most recent interesting mods on Nexus. Flora, trees, landscape and environmental modifications are for many the most integral parts of any load order. These are the type of mods that really lay the fundamentals for how you want your game to look. And for this video we'll start off with some of the mods of the kind that have really stood out so far this year. Starting with a mod by Abobmer, who if you remember last year, came out with the very interesting grass mod that was Midsummer. While I really liked the sheer aesthetic of the mod, it was very limited with its strictly saturated summertime look. And not to mention, boy you needed one hell of a graphics card in order to run it at a smooth frame rate. See, if you were to look at Midsummer as the hot chick you had a bit of fun with during summer, then Abobmer's newest mod, Folkvanger Grass and Landscape Overhaul is the pretty, more down to earth girl you settled down with for Christmas. What began as a simple update to Midsummer evolved into the extensive grass and landscape overhaul that is Folkvanger. It looks more complete, with new types of grasses to fit different biomes, with each hold of Skyrim getting a new revamped look. The pine forest commonly seen in Falkreath looks somewhat familiar to what's to be seen in Midsummer, with that short but dense green grass. There's also some brown in there with dead twigs, sticks and leaves, a lot of variation. From patches of brown, sort of muddy leaves here and there, Two fields covered in clovers, or might it be wood sorrel, I can't say for sure, but it looks beautiful, to some real spiky grass of both green and brown. The colors of green and brown are synonymous to pine forests, and the Bobmer understands that as the mod expands on that very aspect of the area. And something very important to note here with this mod is that the pine forest is one of three biomes where new matching landscape textures have been added as you can see from the before and afters in the way it overrides the base vanilla textures. I know this can seem troublesome for some of you with bigger and highly modified load orders, but I suggest letting the Folkvanger landscape textures overwrite whatever texture mods you might be using, at least in the areas where you want the grass from this mod to appear, as the matching landscape provides for better transitions. Moving on to the tundra around Whiterun, the landscape is covered in spiky grass of yellowy brown, with dark green plants and these taller ferns. It certainly fits the surrounding landscapes and structures. In addition to the pine forest seen before, this grass also comes with its new matching landscape texture. Stretching over the vast plains from White Run through elks, mammoths, and some dangers, all the way to Rorikstead, the grass is of a consistent density, and hey, even the kinds of people like Nazim will find their midday walk through these fields to be quite pleasurable. But as we move on eastwards to the Hall of the Rift, my oh my, ladies and gentlemen, does Folkvanger absolutely give these autumn forests a touch of magic and vibrancy, with longer, swirly strands of grass of green and red brown, plants, ferns, and leaves scattered around on the ground with this indeed being the last of the three areas where the mod affects the landscape textures. The style in which it overhauls this hold is my personal favorite out of the bunch. The color mashup looks splendid and translates that fantastical autumn feel in quite a way I like. And while in some spaces the grasses are of a lengthier kind, I didn't find it too distracting while playing. There's a reason this grass is popping up everywhere in screenshots as of late folks. It looks gorgeous and couldn't be more of a contrast to the grass Folkvanger adds to the swampy biome of Morthol, with that grey brown dead grass to maintain that eerie feel of the area. Landscape textures have not been made as of yet for this area, so whatever textures you've got in your load order won't be overwritten. The grass is thick, dense, high quality and when that misty nighttime hits it enhances that signature, horrific feel that haunts the saltwater marsh. Across the Karth river westwards towards solitude, the grass seen here is mostly of the green brown grass seen earlier, and the grass more towards the east northern cold parts of Skyrim are well, not that different, I mean it's not like there should be any noticeable amount of grass here so the mod keeps it lore friendly. The last hold of interest where it makes a big change is in the highlands of the reach, up in the high altitudes of the wild 
wild hills, Folkvanger covers the before quite barren land with a nice dense carpet of darkish green. I've always had trouble getting the reach to look the way I want. I guess all that trauma playing Skyrim as a young Gim getting chased by the Forsworns made me feel a certain way about this landscape. But the newly added grass really enriches these areas, creating for some beautiful scenery from the Forsworn encampments scattered about to the orc strongholds and not to forget the entrance to Markarth itself. The grass blends in quite nicely. All in all, Folkvanger is a banger of a mod for anyone looking for a simple overhaul that'll enhance the look of their game. It makes for some wonderful scenery and it's overall very consistent with its coverage of the various different areas, all at quite a low cost of your FPS compared to many other grass mods. I mean, there's a reason it's got so many downloads in such a short time. I just think it's important to make note of the changes it makes to the landscapes as shown earlier for those looking to properly implement the mod into their already stacked load orders. <laughs> And released around the same time as Folkvanger, a lot of people have seen fit to pair it up with Origins of Forest 3D Forest Grass by Forbidden, probably one of the more distinctly different flora modifications of all time. See, this mod aims to reflect the dynamic, wild, unpredictable growth of a great forest. You know, rather than just grass, it adds these tall plants that really stick out and works wonders for anyone wanting to replicate a sort of extremely realistic foresty look to their game. This one's really up to taste. If you're looking to add it as a tool for screen, archery then this is quite good but if you're thinking about adding this for a normal playthrough you better be ready for some real thickness look i'm not the most claustrophobic person around but walking through these thickets certainly makes me feel a certain way like you just don't know what could be lying ahead behind the next set of branches and plants danger can pop up at any corner without you knowing to claim your life the fact that this was mainly made for the purpose of vr i can't even imagine what that experience would be like In addition to the main file, with different EMBs impacting how these plants look, there's also a less saturated version, a less saturated darker version, and a more personalized tweaked option from the Malather, featuring a more emphasized highlights of leaves and adjusted colorization for less of a bluish look. Getting up close to these leaves, they look very fresh and green, and are of indeed quite a nice quality. So, if you've been looking to add a big drastic change to your pine forests, Origins of Forest does just that. And speaking of forests, what truly makes a forest are the trees. There are already quite a couple of nice tree mods out and about, but only a select few seek to maintain that vanilla Skyrim feel of the trees. That's why when the Sith Lord releases vanilla-friendly tree-altering mods, it caught my attention. As you can see, it maintains most of the form factor and style of the vanilla trees, and I know there's an audience of people who like to keep their trees as vanilla-like as possible, all while making them look better. First, there's the Bark Textures Overhaul mod, Realistic Spruce and pine bark textures. With textures made from photos of spruces and pines growing in the Ismailovo forest in Moscow, this provides the tree barks with a new genuine higher quality look. With textures all the way up to 8k, you can choose from both the spruce textures seen on screen right now, or the lighter colored pine version if that's more to your taste. Whichever one you pick, you can be sure they'll look good. Both, depending on the surrounding areas and biomes, come in versions covered in ash on the Isle of Saltsheim and light snow in the colder regions of Skyrim. And to complete the whole look of these trees, the mod author also released Pine Branches Redone, which replaces the pines of these trees with something of a more realistic quality and textures that go all the way up to 16k for the most pinpoint of screen archers. Putting both these mods together makes for a nice overall collection of trees. In terms of compatibility, while not compatible with the popular enhanced vanilla tree, you can use them together with fading signals simply bigger trees for a more intimidating look. At the end of the day, it all comes down to personal preference, so if this looks like something you'll like, go ahead and try it out. Next, we have quite a revolutionary and to the best of my knowledge, the most downloaded mod of 2021 so far with close to 100,000 downloads in two months. Uh, yeah guys, I think it's safe to say that Skyrim modding ain't dying out anytime soon. Anyways, dynamic volumetric lighting and sun shadows by True Draconis and Lonely Kitsune is an SKSE plugin that ensures better synchronization between the sun and shadows. More specifically, this mod adjusts the F-Sun Direction X Extreme setting, frame by frame 
flame, improving upon Skyrim's shadow and volumetric lighting system. See, if there's a big house blocking your view to the sun, then the sun rays won't just magically pass through. No, they'll be blocked. Due to this, yes, most of your Skyrim will be covered in shadows, but it's for the sake of immersion. You know, while I like to think the almighty Talos is sitting up there holding the sun downwards lighting up the landscape of Skyrim, that simply just ain't true. And the mod authors here understand that with the sunlight beaming onto the landscape in a more horizontal way, meaning the spaces behind something like a group of trees facing the sun will mostly be covered in a blanket of shadows. It's immersive and albeit at a loss of a few frames at times, looks absolutely wonderful. Full. And the same can be said for Windave's fantastical overhaul of Alduin and the mod Deform Alduin. This is a mod that truly brings up the badassery level, fitting to someone referred to as the World Eater, the Twilight God and the First Dragon, the main antagonist of Skyrim. Bethesda really did try their best to make Alduin stand out. I mean, he looks somewhat different to the other dragons, but if you're gonna make him stand out with a more dark, divine look as the Harbinger of the Apocalypse, then why not make him darker and more fearsome as Windave's done here? The textures have been remade wonderfully, with the high poly to low poly workflow where you try to keep it performance friendly with sacrificing as little quality as possible. What really stands out here as well, next to the textures that go all the way up to 16k, are the optional particle lit eyes of the Dara Lima style we've all come to love. The retexture just adds that final touch to make our beloved dragon that more menacing and epic. Now yes, it's not like we see Alduin that often when out adventuring in Skyrim, it's kinda what makes him special. So as we continue in the modding realm of creature visuals, in a set of mods that have more of an effect on your day-to-day -day gameplay, see, the mod author that goes by the name of Fourth Unknown's been releasing new creature additions at a rapid pace the last months. These are actually all based on creatures from the Elder Scrolls lore. For now, we'll take a look at the ones released in 2021. Starting out with the addition of the new strange creature mainly to be found in the Reach, the six-legged furry-tempered and horned creature known as the Eketeer. The Eketeers are large-tusked and horned mammals with some really sketchy-looking pointed hooves, and are described as shaggy giant centipede high-altitude thriving herd beasts, which indeed sounds like something you wouldn't want to stumble upon out in the wild. But the ones found in and around the orc strongholds are actually quite calm, as the Orsmer have cultivated them as livestock and beasts of burden. Go outside in the wild, however, and you'll find them to be quite hostile as when threatened, they won't hesitate to launch themselves head first at the target. They also spit. Uh, yes, they spit. You know, they, they spit venom, that'll slow you down, you know, kinda similar to the frostbite spider. The Eketeer are very goosebump inducing up close, but definitely add a lot to the mountainous landscape of the Reach and the strongholds. Massive, powerful, and dimly intelligent servants of the Daedra Lord Malakath, the addition of Ogrims your Skyrim will make you think twice before approaching. Described as fat face ogres, these heavy breathing Ogrims look quite funny with their loose and drippy double chin, ogre like teeth, and horns, and let's not forget the massive bulge of a belly to be found up front. The back is quite reptile like and scaly. Oh, and they have four nipples. This model actually comes in three different versions, with the wild and curious feral Ogrim being of a smaller size, the base naked Ogrim being a little bigger, and the humongous Ogrim Lord with his stylish pansies and massive lethal hammer. All of these can actually be conjured as summonable followers by collecting the scrolls from Giant's Grove, from one of my favorite smaller questlines, the Cursed Tribe. Sent into the mortal world to menace living things for the amusement of Daedra Princes, the Ogrims are more than capable of dealing damage in combat, even proving a mighty challenge for giants. Of a much, much smaller scale, associated with the Daedric Prince Mehrun's Dagon are the agile and pesky scamps. With their pointy ears, furred covered legs, and sneaky demeanor, they certainly look like they're up to no good. Also, I really like the detail on the faces of these, it kinda looks like they've taken a bit too much of an interest in the good old moon sugar. Now despite their size, like most other creatures of the Daedra, they quite much delight in cruelty, and in combat you'll find them to be quite agile and snappy as they claw at you. Like the Ogrims, the Scamps are also summonable by attaining a set of scrolls found at the College of Winterhold, in the case you're ever in need of the aid of not quite loyal, but decent servants. Also servants of the Daedra, Molag Bal specifically, are the fearsome reptilian Daedrots. 
These look very intimidating with their big crocodile style heads, long claws, razor sharp teeth, scaly backs and their skin glistening in the daylight. And they are indeed quite intimidating as in combat, charging at you on all fours to claw your face off, they look as ruthless as ruthless can be. If they can't find a way to get up close to you, they'll give you a hot embrace with their fire spewing abilities. This is honestly the one of fourth unknown's creatures that strikes the most fear in my heart. I mean they look terrifying. Luckily they can be used to aid in battle as well, with the spells also to be found in the college among other places. From the standard Daedroth, the Daedroth Lord, the Elder Daedroth and the Scarred Up Feral Daedroth, this is certainly not a group of creatures you'd want to stumble upon. Speaking of creatures you do not want to stumble upon, ever thought you needed to add large aggressive beetles that spit fire into your game? Well, native to Morrowind, attracted to biomes covered in ash, the shocks are just that. These are actually to be found both in the games of ESO and Morrowind, but I really like Fourth Unknown's take on them here. When threatened, these insect type creatures possess flammable glands, spewing out both beams of fire as well as fireballs. You'll encounter these insects both in Souls Time and the Rift. The last creature added by the Molothor's most recent modification has been implemented in quite a different way to the others. To the mountains northeast of Riften, a little fortress stands tall on the mountainside. Once you finally make your way inside and find the path towards your goals, you may come to find that there are certain dangers lurking in the dark. As you make your way through these halls, through the heaps of delusional servants, you'll come to hear the increasing, ominous rumblings of what's deep within. The rumblings of a distorted half dumber half beast abomination, it's the Ascended Sleeper. Appearing as hunched robed humanoids with mottled skin, with the long grotesque tentacles, they are not only intelligent, but also aggressive and dangerous to all when disturbed, hurling dangerous destruction spells at their foes. In what is the Ascended Sleeper's research area, you'll also find a very unique and familiar looking hammer, the Sixth House Bell Hammer. There's also a spell tone here for you to conjure Ascended Sleepers of your own. Fourth Unknown really has hit it spot on when it comes to the look of these creatures. The texture seen on the models not only look good, but matches the game's own existing assets perfectly. Now if you want to see the daily lives of some of these creatures narrated by the nether region tingling voice of Daniel Hodge, make sure to check out Burnsy's brilliant video with the creatures of Nern. When it comes to changing the look of our Skyrim in a way that significantly improves our visuals, there are a select few mod authors that really stand out. One of them is Wizkid, who recently came out with the mod Wizkid Parallax Imperial Forts. This is a complete overhaul of all Imperial Forts related models found in game, each with a touch of Wizkid's brilliance in high quality textures and that signature parallax effect on top, with of course the parallax shader fix needed to make use of that feature. From new exteriors to interiors and metal structures, there are certainly a lot of details to unravel here. The outer walls have been replaced with these big lightly moss covered rocks, showing the wear and tear on these fortresses, while at the same time giving them a sense of sturdiness with them still being up for such a long time, to the point of moss screwing out the depths of the rocks. It is very much when looking at these that the parallax effect is apparent, with them having that 3D look. The same can also be said about the other assets over overhauled in the exterior. It looks more modernized to today's standards while retaining the old feel of these fortresses. Not only does it look amazing on the outside, but what Wizardry Wiz has done to the interiors, they simply feel a lot more fortressy now. The candles light flickering in the dark, and the hue of the torches glistening off the old stony walls, creating for some wonderful aesthetic candy to the eye. The walls, roof and floor have a real earthy, natural crumbly look to them, and walk Walking through these redone holes of the interiors, it feels more eerie and mysterious. All metallic surfaces use cube map as well, with the UV maps having been carefully improved. Overall, this is an awesome alternative for a structure not often touched significantly by any texture overhauls of the past. It also comes with LOD files included, 
fixing the infamous White Run Watchtower lot issue as well. This mod gives your Skyrim fortresses that much needed revamped look, and I definitely recommend trying it out. And do you know what else needs a complete revamped look? Let's head on down underground to the vanilla Dwemer ruins. See, these are the remains of the ancient Dwemer settlements. Structures that once served as significant places of knowledge and technology. And to make these look the part, here's the mod Dwemer Pipework Reworked by Caleb2 aka Anubis. This is a rework of the Dwemer Pipework, also including Dwemer Boilers and if you've ever been to the Dwemer world spaces of Skyrim, you know there's literally pipes going into all sorts of machines to be seen everywhere, so the impact the mod makes on these locations is indeed not to be questioned. From pipelines going into all directions as they swerve and twirl everywhere into various machinery, the mod covers everything in a true epic combination of stone, the ancient Dwemer metalwork and steam. As you can see, it transforms the before very much fake pipes designed to give the illusion of working ventilation and heating system with Caleb 2's models and meshes that actually make that system a reality. The meshes have been reworked to have transparency, with animated fans inside to be seen through the holes and gaps, not to mention they have increased glossiness, but not to the point of making it look too clean. No, what I love here is that these pipes look really old and rusty, as they should for the sake of immersion. The Dwemer boilers have also been made to look a lot more pleasing to the eye, as these as well look as if they're really working with the added glow of the heat streaming out of the ventilation grills, creating for a very unique atmosphere. Fear. Now, of course, the look of these will look different in correlation with the other mods on your mod list. So, if you find the glow of the boiler to be too bright, there's an optional file for a 50% darker redder variant. If you even want to add a little something extra to these pipes, you can also overwrite the main file with a file containing textures with a decorative pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an understatement when I tell you that this mod will make your Dwemer ruins look better. In the lore, Dwemer ruins are described as a sight to behold as they were massive and filled with materials and stonework mastered to perfection. This mod gets that across quite nicely. But as you venture through and explore these new Dwemer structures, wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of Dwemer weaponry of the same quality to make use of when in the face of the imminent dangers that lie deep within? The mod author John Zemex did something of the kind about four years ago with his stylish Dwemer blades in what was an incredibly dope complete rework of the Dwarven weaponry to make them more unique. Now I'm quite a big fan of these, they look masterful, but there's just this one thing about them. Although the silver design puts the very and sleek, you might come to think that they don't quite match the Dwemer aesthetic. And that is where the newer mod by Eivold, Stylish Dwarven Weapons 4K Bronze-like Textures comes in, with its 4K texture replacement of the blades, adding a bronze-like golden texture to match it with most of the in-game Dwarven materials. These look absolutely great in hand, and just like Dwemer Pipework reworked, it really captures that ancient Dwemer feel from the swords and daggers to the axes, hammer and mace, as well as as the bow, I just really like the design of these. And if you still feel like the older silver version is more to your liking despite the color, then hey, now you know about that one as well. The weapons look quite a fit of what was created at the hand of the ancient dwarven weaponsmiths, with their famed unique high quality materials. The inclusion of wood on the handles was a pretty good idea as well. And just like most good mods on Nexus, it's got the legendary Mr. Banana 17's seal of approval. <laughs> We head on up to the surface to properly admire our new dwarven weapons in that fine natural lighting, we can improve that view with a very much revolutionary modification for first person combat. Taking the Nexus by storm was Shoryuken Bruh's first person combat altering mod. First person combat animation is overhaul 2.0 size matters. The way this mod simply elevates the first person combat system of our dear old game is breathtaking. With well over 60 new animations to enhance your first person combat experience, Shoryuken Bruce tried his very best to do what none other has done successfully, and that's to fix the very floaty, slenderman, arm-whipping vanilla animations that is Bethesda's original combat system. We're talking all new attack, power, 
block and bash animations. Even idle and equip animation is exclusive to some of the weapons. As you can see from the new one-handed weapon animations of the sword, war axes, maces and daggers, which you before couldn't really differentiate with how they all shared the same lackluster arm flinging, these all now look and feel very different. A warrior using the standard but trustworthy sword will come to feel their attacks looking and feeling swifter as they slice and cut into their enemies. Switching to the axe, you'll properly feel the hack as you stick the pointy end into your target. The maces are a lot more fun to use as well, with how it now properly bludgeons and crushes the target with the blunt round end. And oh boy, the new dagger animations! These will really enhance your nighttime sneaking stealth scenarios with its new stabby functionalities, even coming with a new really badass custom look for dual dagger wielding, so you can truly stalk your prey before you deal the final blow with what can only be described as a swift encounter with death from the dark. The heavier two-handed weapons like greatswords, battle axes and warhammers all feel, well, more heavier of course, as they should. From the way your character now carry these with a little more effort and brutally strike, stab and hack at foes with real intent. There's also custom animations for an Akavimi style of combat with katanas. Swinging the blade around like this like a true master of the sword is just a lot of fun. When Skyrim first came out, first person really was my preferred way to play the game. I mean, there's just nothing that beats the sense of immersiveness you get from that point of view. But with Skyrim animation mods often and mostly focusing on the third person aspect of the game, and me of course having a desire to see my character's ass, a assets of high quality armor and clothing, you know, from all the armor and outfit mods, I've definitely found myself drifting towards a more third person style of playing throughout the years. This mod has really reignited a certain desire to play this game in the first person. The weapons just feel a lot more impactful now. You can sort of feel the stickiness as your weapon pierces the flesh. So with the mod author having learned Blender and other tools just to make the single mod, he deserves all the praise in the world. Now if you're looking for other mods to pair this one up with to get the most out of your first person combat experience, I really recommend checking out the old and wise Sim Gaming's video listing such mods if you haven't already. It's a really good watch. Moving on to two smaller but highly impactful mods I feel a lot of you might find quite neat, I present you first to Completionist Quest Tracker by Iconic Code. This is a true lifesaver of a mod for all you adventurers who like to consider yourself true completionists and not to mention connoisseurs of questing. See this adds a complete automatic quest tracking mod configuration menu of the base game, DLC and some popular quest mods like Falskar, Vigilant and Legacy of the Dragonborn only to mention a few. This makes organizing how you want to go about your playtime a little bit easier, with the quests of both the normal and radiant type sectionalized into categories of the main quests, DLC, towns and cities, guilds and factions, you can easily set course and keep track of the quests left for you to properly complete different areas of the map. It's also compatible with the Dear Diary menu replacer so many like to use, but you might want to keep the original black theme to match up with the mod Dialogue Interface reshaped by Shaper 8. See, to be fair to Bethesda, one thing they really did get right was a very sleek sort of float the dialogue interface, but as can be seen by the abundance of HUD altering mods out there, there's a demand for these types of mods as they can freshen up the look of your playthroughs. And that's pretty much exactly what this one does. It's unintrusive, sticks to the vanilla theme, looks modern and it's a real pleasure to use. Also I've been having none of those misclicks I often find myself having normally, although that may just be me being an idiot. Uh, anyways, Dialogue Interface Reshaped is a pretty dope mod. And speaking of dope, just like how ketamine provides you with a rush of chilled, relaxed happiness, uh, not promoting drugs here by the way, most of us in the Skyrim modding community get that same feeling when we hear the words capital and expansion put together. And what if we further add those two words into the context of Windhelm? Because there is a mod that truly grasps everything this old city of kings stands for. From the early mornings, when the predominantly Nord populated city wakes up to reminisce of old stories of Isgrimor and share in their traditional beliefs of Talos, while workers on the docks welcome ships from other lands for trade and commerce, to nighttime when the city falls into an eerie sleep with nothing but the faint singing and noise of the proud Nords echoing out into the dark from the lit up Candlehearth Inn, all while the Dunmer are forced to reside in the pitiful slum that is the Grey Quarter, only to hope for a better future. 
To say that Sir Yamta's capital Windelm expansion makes a change to the old stone city does not do it justice. Starting from the central stone quarter, the new city layout is a lot more open, making traversal throughout the various three quarters connected by intertwining streets a lot more convenient. And within these quarters, you'll find all the new homes belonging to the new NPCs added to enhance the core identity of Windhelm's rich cultural history and current standing. The new NPCs fit right in as they go on about their day of work, even offering branching lines of dialogue so they don't feel out of place. They all serve a purpose, whether that is to sell items and wares, tend to bakeries and meaderies, or promote Stormcloak propaganda and spread the word of Talos. The quarter of Valenstrad has been expanded with more housings for the proud noble northern clans and houses. Here you'll also find a new museum containing all sorts of Windhelm history, run by the very knowledgeable and peculiar character that is the retired mage Yarandi. The Grey Quarter has been overhauled as well, with new smaller buildings, homes and shops offering imported goods from the Isles of Solstheim stacked on top of one another, with the Dunmer making use of every single inch of the small area they've been confined to. This extends to the outside as well, with the newly added Dark Elf Shanty Town further to the east of the main gate and the Dock District, which indeed also sees a new expansion in the new merchants leading up to the gate, giving Windhelm more of that big city feel. And the bridge now comes with stairs leading down to the docks, again making traversal around the city a lot easier and more convenient than before. The new Dock District to the west with smaller houses is a fantastic addition and it really does feel like it always should have been there to begin with. The same goes with the really unique addition of the frozen wheelhouse with Solvar the Steady patrolling its towers and keeping a caring eye on the wheel. Again, it all feels natural and organic, a lot to do with the fact that it's based off of Bethesda's concepts from before release. But you know, adding these structures and expanding upon the city's layout is one thing, but it's the way the mod author does it that makes his capital expansion series so unique. For every NPC, there's a backstory. For every building, there's a purpose. And scattered around in forms of new literature, statues and carvings are shades of the old proud history of Windhelm. Immersing you even further into the city's day-to-day -day life are the various new quests you'll be able to experience. Simple tasks like deliveries of Mannheim's soon-to-be-famous mead. On the docks, Signy's got some unwanted guests in her last shipment from Solstheim. And deep within the city, Verung is plotting to deal with a Thalmor spy. Additions like these to flesh out the already profound overhaul of the city makes this without a doubt the most comprehensive expansion to Windhelm. And there we have it for this time. As always, links to all the modifications shown in the video are to be found below. Go show some love to the mod authors by endorsing them on Nexus. Without them, none of this would be possible. Oh, and why not just subscribe? With that, <laughs> I'll finally let you go on about your day. Thanks for watching. This has been Gim. May your role lead you to warm sands, everyone. See ya.